Hello, this is Mr. Reiner. Today I'm introducing our topic, which is Native Americans of present day United States and Canada and North America. So I have to be very specific with this because we're talking about uh, the Native Americans before Europeans came to uh, where we live today in US and also Canada because that's our unit. And, uh, but we're specifically talking about those in North America, okay? And also our, uh, we're gonna talk about Mexico and Central America later. So Mexico is part of North America and a lot of countries South Mexico um, are as well, but that's another unit. So we're only talking about the Native Americans of the continental United States and Canada, okay? So in other words, Hawaii and the territories are not included in this. All right, so our objectives for today and uh, remember, please read this aloud with me and your other teachers when we have these. Today, I will learn about the indigenous, which means native, people from the U.S. and Canada in North America. So I can understand how people lived in our area before international immigration. I will know I have it when I can ask our museum guest at least one intelligent question related to our topic. Okay, there's your clue. We have a guest today. Um, actually, both of our videos after this are made by people from, or at least connected to the Bell County Museum. And they have some really good information to share with us about Native Americans in general, but also more specifically uh, here in uh, Bell County. So, or at least the Bell County area. Um, but the thing about all this is, and I really wanted to go over uh, an in-depth history. Um, I actually have this book here I've been reading for this purpose uh, to, to get to know more about Native Americans and the history and all that. Um, so I, I can try to my best answer lots of questions for you if you have them. Uh, but what they ended up preparing for us was really well done. So we're gonna use that. We're gonna watch those two videos. And then at the end, um, someone from the museum is going to uh, come in and we're going to have a live question and answer session. Okay, so without further ado, let's begin. Hi everyone, my name is Katie and today we're going to learn a little more about Native Americans in Texas. Historians have found evidence that the first people here in the United States arrived a couple of different ways. One way was that the first people arrived on the continent from Asia by crossing a land bridge that joined the two continents in Siberia. Another way was that peoples arrived in the Americas through the use of animal skin boats traveling across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans from the European and Asian continents. This map shows the different Native American tribes that called Texas home. You can see that the Comanche was the main tribe in our area. The Cotto, meaning true chiefs, were a farming tribe who lived in tall cone-shaped grass huts that would hold several families. In addition to farming, they also hunted deer, turkey, rabbits, squirrel, and other small game animals that were local to the area. Clothing was made from the skins of the animals hunted for food. The tribe also made pottery, wood carvings, and hand-woven baskets for both practical use and artwork. The Comanche, whose name means enemy, were nomadic hunter-gatherers that followed the herds of buffalo and deer across central Texas, including the area that is now Bell County. They were known to be a more violent group, raiding other tribes for their goods and kidnapping members to join their own family. This made them enemies of almost every other tribe in the area. The Comanche lived in buffalo hide teepees that were easily taken down and reconstructed as they traveled following the herd. Their clothing and bags were made from the skins of local animals, including deer and buffalo. Their regalia and art consisted of beautiful beadwork, feathers, silver, and copper jewelry that could also be used for trade with the other tribes and later Anglo settlers. They also valued eagle feathers, which were often used in their regalia to signify those of great power and bravery. The Apache, known as the people, were both hunter-gatherers and farmers. They lived in simple wooden framed homes covered in brush and buffalo hides called wickiups. The people of the tribe hunted deer and buffalo, gathered pecans, prickly pear fruit, and agave, and also farmed corn, beans, and squash. Like other tribes, the clothing was also made from the skins of the animals hunted for food. The regalia of this tribe included beautiful beadwork, and tribe members also made hand-woven baskets for practical use and art. 
The Tonkawa were the friendliest of the tribes in Texas, and the name of the tribe means they all stayed together. Other tribes would camp and hunt with the Tonkawa each year, and they also commonly traded goods with each other so that everyone could have access to different necessities. The Tonkawa hunted deer and buffalo, fished in the local waterways, and gathered wild plants. The people lived in buffalo hide teepees like the Comanche, and clothing was also made from the skins of those animals hunted for food. Their art consisted of buffalo hide paintings that tell legends and histories of the people and also copper jewelry that could be traded for goods with other tribes and later Anglo settlers. Finally, the Wichita, named for the tribal town in which they lived, were great farmers. The tribe grew corn, pumpkins, squash, beans, and also hunted local wildlife, including deer and buffalo. They lived in tall beehive-shaped grass-thatched houses that could house one or multiple families. The people of the tribe made pottery, beautiful beadwork, and buffalo hide paintings that told of their history and local legends. The Wichita also greatly valued elk teeth and used them to decorate their clothing and for trade with other tribes. The Comanche were the largest tribe in this area. The people were nomadic, which means they followed the herds of deer and buffalo across central Texas. Since they moved often, the teepees were easy to travel with and construct in a new area. Women were the tea free owners and were responsible for finding a good area for the tribe to camp. The women set the teepees up themselves, learning this skill at a very young age. Teepees are made of long, thin wooden poles and covered with buffalo hides. The buffalo hides were then painted with pictures telling of legends and histories of the Comanche people. These paintings were called winter counts and were very important. The bottom of the teepee cover was raised in the summer to allow air to flow through and cool the teepee down. The same flap was closed tightly during the winter to lock in the heat from the fire burning within. The top of the teepee opened in flaps that allowed the smoke from the fire to escape. The door of the teepee always faced east toward the rising sun. Beds within were buffalo hides on the ground and chairs consisted of backrests made of wooden rods that were tied together and propped up on three legs. The furniture could be easily rolled and packed when the tribe moved on. There were rules and etiquette in place for life within the teepee so that all could live in harmony together, much like the rules and etiquette we follow today. The men of the different Native American tribes hunted buffalo and deer in the local area. Bows and arrows were used for hunting so that the men could keep a safe distance from their prey. All the older men of the tribe would go together to hunt. Scouts were sent out ahead of the others to find the herd and report back with the number of buffalo or deer within. The men would then attack with their bows and arrows and return to the camp with the meat they had gained. The introduction of horses by Europeans made the hunt more successful as the men were able to move faster and carry more back to the camp. Every part of the buffalo was used. The hide was made into clothing, blankets, and teepee covers, and the horns and bones were made into tools, cups, utensils, and weapons. The brains and liver were used to soften and preserve the hide before tanning it for use. Leftover meat was dried and made into jerky. Women and younger men stayed in the camp for those tribes that farmed in order to take care of the crops. Native Americans of all tribes believed the earth was the grandmother and the creator was the grandfather of all life. For this reason, nature was highly regarded and all tribe members were taught as children that they shared the earth with the plants and animals of the area. The powwow began as a gathering held in the spring where Native Americans celebrated the circle of life with feasting, dancing, and music. Local plants were used to cleanse the air and beautiful regalia was worn to honor the grandmother and grandfather. The regalia of each tribe was very important to its members. The decorations showed military rank and achievements and membership within the tribe itself. Clothing was decorated with such regalia to show the position of a person within the tribe and the accomplishments they had made in their life, including successful hunts or even powerful positions such as chief. Regalia includes belts, shields, breastplates, jewelry, headdresses, fans, and more. Eagle feathers were greatly valued among the Comanche due to their rarity and were worn only by certain members of the tribe who had proven themselves worthy of such a sacred adornment. Feathered headdresses were used only in special ceremonies such as the powwow and typically only by shaman and tribal leaders. 
All tribes also traded goods with each other, including food hunted and farmed, weapons, clothing, jewelry, pottery, and woven baskets. As more Anglo settlers moved to the area, Native Americans also traded with them to gain items such as metal pots, knives, axes, and guns. This contact with Anglo settlers to trade allowed cultural elements to be shared between the two groups and brought changes to the native style of dress, food preparation, hunting, and even warfare. From a young age, children were taught how to perform daily tasks and chores. Boys were taught to ride horses, hunt, and fight to protect their tribe. Girls learned to cook, set up the teepees, care for the children, and sew clothing. The history and legends of the people were told through oral histories by elders, and each taught children important lessons about nature, their tribe, and the accomplishments of their people throughout time. In addition to chores that helped the tribe, kids were also encouraged to take part in art and games. All learned how to make pottery and baskets, as well as how to make regalia and paintings, including winter count. Girls commonly played with dolls to help them practice caring for children when they became mothers. Boys played games that helped them to be better hunters, including the hoop and stick game, in which one boy would roll a large hoop to the other players, who would try to shoot a stick through the hoop as it rolled. Like the Lakota in the Dakota areas, the Comanche incorporated winter counts into their teepees. The paintings were added to the outside of the buffalo hide and told of significant events and achievements by the tribe's most important figures in a given year. Each year, the keeper of the count added one symbol to represent a significant event from that year. The counts were then maintained by the tribe for generations so that the descendants would remember the past. The winter count in this picture is of the Lakota tribe and tells the story of the tribe from 1800 to 1871, including such events as war, great hunts, disease, and encounters with both other tribes and Anglo settlers. Using these symbols, make your own winter count story about significant events that have taken place in your life this year. The Galt site is located about 30 minutes southwest of Belton, near Florence. It was discovered by archaeologists that the Galt site was very important to Paleo-Indians up to 20,000 years ago because it is part of two eco-zones, which means that they have an abundance of all the different things they need to survive, water, shelter, and food that they can hunt and gather. Let's hear more from an archaeologist from the Galt School. Clark Wardeke. I'm the executive director of the Galt School of Archaeological Research. I'm going to tell you a little bit about archaeology and archaeologists today. Uh, first of all, archaeologists are interested in the recent past and the long past, and we get to that by looking at material artifacts and environmental data. In other words, we look at your stuff. We're looking at ancient garbage to try and figure out how people behaved. Archaeologists aren't really interested in individual artifacts. We're interested in human beings and how they made decisions in the past. And we're trying to figure out how people might make decisions in the future. That's what archaeology is about. The way we get to that is through digging up all kinds of information. There are archaeologists we call garbologists that work on modern garbage dumps. And there are archaeologists that work on the very earliest human beings. And that's what the Galt School is interested in, the earliest peoples in the Americas. So we probably have the least amount of data, the stuff that survived 20 or 30,000 years. Now, when we're looking for that, we use a whole bunch of different kinds of methods. And sometimes we use backhoes and bulldozers. And sometimes we use picks and shovels. But normally what you see is archaeologists using hand tools, starting out with things like a pick a hoe. It's just a little pick, right? And we have those in various sizes all the way down to things like archaeological hand picks that you can dig with. More often than not, you see archaeologists working with things like this. It's a mason trowel. And we sharpen the edges, and we very, very slowly scrape at the dirt because we have to get all the things together in context. Archaeologists are like detectives. 
And we need all of those clues together to try and recreate a story. Now, oftentimes when we get down to the very smallest clues, then we're working with very, very small tools. And sometimes it's things like this. It's an artist's palette knife. Looks like a little tiny trowel. And even things like bamboo, just a piece of bamboo that we use for slowly digging. We use a lot of chopsticks. That's a very handy tool. So out of all these tools, there's actually only one tool that I own that actually was made for archaeologists, and that's this, the archaeological handpick. All the rest of our tools come from other fields, from construction, from physics, from all kinds of fields. Archaeology is a science that borrows from everything to try and put together this story of how people behaved in the past. Now, our signature site and the, uh, the site that our organization was named for, the Galt site, is actually more than 20,000 years old. People have been living here for that long in Texas. And if people were living in Texas 20,000 years ago, that means that people were in the Americas probably 25 to 30,000 years ago before they could even get to Texas. And we found a lot of things here. Uh, among other things, we found uh, incised stones, stones with incised designs on it. Now, Probably can't see this in the camera, but it's got a little grid of designs on it. And stones like this that were found at the Galt site are the earliest dated art in the Americas. We also found a, a mammoth kill site, one of only 15 known in the Americas, and also the base of a, an old house, floor of a house that was designed to get people up off the clay and that's the oldest excavated house in North America. And a house isn't something you build if you're just there overnight. A house is something you build if you're going to stay for a while. So these people are not half-naked people chasing mammoths across the landscape. They're what we call broad-spectrum hunters and gatherers. They eat everything. And they find a good spot that has water and food and material to make tools out of. And they stay, just like we would. They're all modern human beings like you and I. So there are a lot of cool things found at Galt, and then finding stuff that was as old as 20,000 years ago was kind of the icing on the cake. Currently, we test 10 to 15 sites in Texas every year looking for other sites with the same kind of material. One archaeological site is interesting, but if we get a number of them, then we can start talking about a human culture, about ways that a lot of people behaved. And uh, that's what archaeologists look for. We look for patterns. So that's briefly how archaeologists work. We also try to date these things. We use absolute and relative dating. Relative dating is dating things relative to other things that you already know the date of. So you could look at the colors of a kitchen appliance, and you know how old that kitchen is because those colors change over time. Different colors become the in thing. Well, the same thing happens with tools and pottery and architecture. Styles change over time. So we can use those to try and figure out what time frame we're looking at. We can also use absolute dating, which is how we get calendar dates. And for that, we use a lot of physics. So we use things like carbon-14 dating, which looks at uh, an isotope that uh, living things take in from the sun and give off after they're dead, and we can measure that. And we use things like paleomagnetism, which looks at the Earth's magnetic pole is of the past, or optically stimulated luminescence, which looks at the little tiny pieces of quartz and feldspar in a handful of dirt, and they tell us when they last saw the sun. So there's lots of cool things like that. And I'm sure right now out there, there's somebody working in their garage to come up with the next really cool idea that'll give us even more information about early peoples. That's why archeologists only dig about 10% of a site. If we're gonna be working there, we leave some behind unless it's gonna be destroyed for archeologists in the future who will have new ideas and new instruments and new ways to get even more information about humans in the past.
Paleo Indians hunted for their food, including deer, buffalo, turtles, rabbits, and squirrels. They also foraged for local fruits and vegetables. Their tools were made out of shirt, which was a form of flint, and they napped those to form projectile points, knives, hide scrapers, and more. About 9,000 years ago, Paleo Indians at the Galt site developed the first earth ovens in the area. An earth oven is a large deep hole that is dug into the ground. It is lined with rocks from the local creek bed. A fire is put inside, and vegetables and fruits and meats are put into it and covered back up with dirt and rocks. That is then smoked for two to three days. The most common thing that they put in their earth ovens was the commas lily. The commas lily was known to be poisonous before it was cooked, making many of them sick. Once it cooked, though, it could be used not only as a side dish to their meat, but also to be ground down to make breads and other things that were portable. About 1,200 years ago, the bow and arrow was developed. Before that, Paleo Indians were using an atlatl, which is a long stick allowing you to throw a spear up to 150 feet. With the invention of the bow and arrow, hunting became easier. But archaeology is not limited to archaeological sites. This mammoth tusk was found in temple in the Pepper Creek area.